Hi, I'm Bill Singh, and uh, I just finished watching an episode of uh, Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. Uh, very interesting show, and uh, as a young Earth creationist, it makes it all the more interesting, I think, for me to watch. Uh, in all reality, uh, I don't find a whole lot wrong with the episode, other than, of course, I disagree with it, in regards to the age of the Earth, the age of the universe, and, and so forth. Um, uh, but because um, I am a young Earth creationist, I guess I have to kind of give you uh, some of my objections to the episode. Not to say it shouldn't be aired or anything, but uh, some of the things I think that uh, if you are, um, if you study the Bible, if you're a Christian, I think that you need to be aware of when you watch this episode of the Cosmos. Uh, number one, uh, toward the beginning of the episode, um, he's talking about uh, planet Earth just briefly, and uh, he has these two, well, he, here's two or three windows. I think that in one window, you see the Earth as it is, and then, uh, then he says, look down below, and you see the Earth. And he said, this is what the Earth looked like 250 million years ago. Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you had a, a, a camera set up back then, and you just kind of snapped a shot, and there it is. The, that's how the Earth existed 250, 000, uh, 250 million years ago. Um, I, I find that kind of dubious that he would say that, or that we would suppose that. See, this is one of the things that really confused me as a child, um, when I would hear scientists talk about things such as this, or, um, or dinosaurs, or whatever. They would do it so matter-of-factly that I would think, oh my goodness, they say that we've never seen dinosaurs before. But the way that they're talking about them, they had to have seen them. How could they possibly have the information they have about them? Know how they look, know how they acted, know how they hunted, know what they eat, know everything, and know how they thought <laughs> just from the fossils that we have. It's impossible to do that. Um, and yet, this is how the Earth looked 250 million years ago. Wow. Uh, that's a huge uh, leap of faith, I think. I mean, I'll give him some credit. I mean, there is some evidence to show the whole Pangea theory and all of that. Uh, whether or not it's true, that's up for debate, and I'm not going to go down that route because, really, I don't know. I don't think we could ever know unless we had a time machine. Um, so I'm just going to stay out of that debate altogether. I don't know which side of it I'm on, honestly, which is very um, not characteristic of myself. I like taking those stances, and really, I can't. I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I better just stay out of that one right there. Um, <coughs> Uh, I guess I kind of skipped ahead a little bit. Uh, I guess the first statement that was really made uh, in this episode is the universe is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. Okay, again, this is something I object to because uh, did it come from a very intelligent person? Yeah, Carl Sagan was a very, very intelligent person. He's the one who said these words. In fact, it was a recording of his voice from his old series, The Cosmos, um, that this recording was played from. Uh, so I, I don't understand why statements like that should not be taken offensively um, but you know if I were to speak about the Bible or young earth creationism uh, on public television or national television you know that I'm subject to scrutiny and everything um, and I guess maybe not the Bible so much but if I were to talk about young earth creationism I'm just a flat-out nutcase if I talk about that on a national platform um, okay so uh, I mentioned those two things uh, number three um, uh, I kind of didn't really appreciate how they characterized the church. Uh, I think it was in the 17th century is what the this particular episode was talking about. Uh, it was uh, cited a particular monk uh, back then who believed that the universe um, was more than what the church had thought it was. Now, let's get something straight right now. What does the Bible teach about the location of the earth in relation to this universe? Well, it, it really doesn't say a whole lot about it. Matter of fact, it leaves a lot uh, for us as humans to discover, I think. Uh, there are certain things that we learn about the earth from the Bible. For instance, in Job, I believe it is, it men mentions that the earth is round. Uh, so that's a huge revelation right there in itself. Um, lots of people interpret uh, that the earth is flat from the Bible. Well, it's, it's never stated in there that the earth is flat. I understand how some people might infer that, but really the Bible never says it. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think there's just a lot of speculation. And uh, I think that, you know, as far as interpreting the Bible, people that say that the earth is flat, 
or though some today that think so, and back then, they were just flat out wrong. Let's just face it. Um, it's not that the Bible teaches that. It's that they, you know, dug into it a little bit deeper. Not not dug, I'm trying to think of the way they oversimplified uh, the way that it was written uh, to fit something that they that they thought was obvious uh, to them. They thought it was obvious that the Earth was flat, and very clearly they were wrong. Uh, the Earth is round. It is spherical, and that's how it is. Um, were the people in the church back then ignorant? Eh, not necessarily. Um, they uh, cited that there was no separation of church and state back then. I think that this is a very dangerous statement uh, to put into people's heads that uh, church and state is inherently evil. In a sense, it will become evil. I will say that because it's not that the church corrupts the state. It's the state that corrupts the church. We need to get that straight in our minds. That's why the Founding Fathers, who the majority of them were Christians, were churchgoers, uh, highly discouraged uh, the mingling of church and state. Not necessarily, the, uh, mingling is the wrong way to put it. Um, the church, the state's influence rather over the church. Uh, I can't remember all the details, but I remember that the phrase itself, church of state, despite uh, separation of church and state, never appears in the Constitution. It actually appears in a letter, I believe, from Thomas Jefferson uh, to somebody uh, in a church who wanted some funding for their church or something from the state. And Jefferson cited this wall between church and state, stating, more or less, that the state cannot interfere with the matters of the church. It doesn't go the other way. People who are in the church can be involved with the state. People inside the church, according to the Founding Fathers, could have uh, involvement in, in national prayers, public prayers, whatever have you. I mean, that's uh, how our system of government was set up. Uh, it's undeniable. If you just look at Washington, D.C., not, not the uh, uh, politicians, by the way. Uh, look at the, uh, the architecture and all the uh, biblical um, <clears throat> all the biblical symbolism inside of, uh, not, not just symbolism, but uh, biblical stories are portrayed um, inside of the architecture uh, in Washington, D.C. itself. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing that I think that we need to be careful about as well watching this episode, which, by the way, why do they mention the separation of church and state in this episode? I really don't understand that unless they have some sort of deeper agenda behind what they're doing. And they really did kind of make it seem, um, uh, to some degree, uh, they, they have a religious um, sort of slant toward it. I, I want to say more of a universal, universalistic type of slant. Uh, Carl Sagan uh, was not an atheist. Uh, he was an agnostic. I don't know a whole lot about his religious beliefs, um, but I would definitely not say he was a Christian. It's very clear he was not a Christian. Um, uh, and they're going sort of down a New Agey type of uh, type of religious track um, in this uh, episode of the Cosmos. I'd be very interested to see the other episodes of the Cosmos. Um, but uh, let's let's move on a little bit so I can finish up real quick. Uh, so they mentioned uh, one man on the entire planet who believed that uh, uh, believed that the Earth was not the center of the universe and he ended up in pr prison. He was talking about Copernicus, uh, showing how uh, abusive the church was. Um, I, I don't. I, I think he was referring to Copernicus, either Copernicus or Galileo. I don't remember. I don't. He didn't mention a name in that example, and I'm not good with dates, so um, I'm not going to go over that. And I'm just recording this real fast just off the top of my head so that I can get it out there. Um, I didn't uh, look up the dates and, and the people and everything. Uh, but it was either Copernicus or Galileo ended up in prison uh, for the sake that he believed that the, uh, uh, that the Earth was not the center of the universe. I know that, I'm pretty sure in Galileo's case though, what you're often not told is that there's actually a deeper story uh, behind Galileo's imprisonment. And I don't want to get the details of that wrong. I have a very uh, bad memory in regards to recalling some of these events and I'm not a an expert on Galileo, uh, but from what I remember uh, reading and hearing, there's actually more to his story than his uh, merely believing that uh, the Earth was not the center of the universe for uh, the sake of his imprisonment. Um, they mentioned Martin Luther uh, believed that uh, the idea that the Earth was not the center of the universe was a scandalous offense to Scripture. <sighs> Martin Luther was a very prominent um, church figure. Uh, a lot of his beliefs uh, are carried on through today. 
um, and a uh, very, very respectable character inside the church just throughout history. Uh, without him, we would probably not have uh, the Protestant church as it exists today, um, which is probably why they cited Martin Luther. Um, uh, we have to be very careful when we show reverence uh, to historical church figures, aside, I would say, from Jesus Christ himself, because everybody outside of him are fallible figures. I don't doubt that Martin Luther, I, again, I want to do more research on this, but I don't doubt that Martin Luther um, said that it was a scandalous offense that the earth is not the center of the universe. Um, uh, but, uh, and uh, Martin Luther, I, I disagree with him, actually, on many points. I don't say many, but quite a few points of his theology. For one, he rejected certain books of the Bible, so uh, on those points, I, uh, I you know, tend to disagree with him. You know, for instance, he rejects the book of James in the Bible, which leads to some very serious uh, uh, theological problems on his behalf. Um, okay, and they mention uh, the monk who, uh, who um, was against the, uh, um, uh, the idea that the earth was the center of the universe, and I think I spoke about that already. Um, and uh, But I thought it was very interesting that uh, that they cited that he mentioned that he worships an infinite God. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. I'll have to do more research on this monk. Again, I'm just kind of getting this out there while it's still fresh in my mind. Uh, but very clear agenda, I think, in this episode. And toward the end of the episode, you have uh, Neil Tyson, the, the uh, narrator, talking about his relationship to Carl Sagan and kind of gives the gospel of Carl Sagan toward the end. Uh, let me play it for you a quick cl sound clip uh, from the episode so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm not making this up. I mean, this is really like the, the gospel of Carl Sagan right here as though he's founded some sort of new uh, bridge between uh, religion and science. Listen as I stare blankly into the screen and look silly. Carl contributed enormously to our knowledge of the planets. He correctly predicted the existence of methane lakes on Saturn's giant moon Titan. He showed that the atmosphere of the early Earth must have contained powerful greenhouse gases. He was the first to understand that seasonal changes on Mars were due to windblown dust. Carl was a pioneer in the search for extraterrestrial life and intelligence. He played a leading role in every major spacecraft mission to explore the solar system during the first 40 years of the space age. But that's not all he did. This is Carl Sagan's own calendar from 1975. Who was I back then? I was just a 17 year old kid from the Bronx with dreams of becoming a scientist. And somehow, the world's most famous astronomer found time to invite me to Ithaca, in upstate New York, and spend a Saturday with him. I remember that snowy day like it was yesterday. He met me at the bus stop and showed me his laboratory at Cornell University. Carl reached behind his desk and inscribed this book for me. For Neo, a future astronomer, Carl. At the end of the day, he drove me back to the bus station. The snow was falling harder. He wrote his phone number, his home phone number, on a scrap of paper. And he said, if the bus can't get through, call me. Spend the night at my home with my family. I already knew I wanted to become a scientist. But that afternoon, I learned from Carl the kind of person I wanted to become. He reached out to me and to countless others, inspiring so many of us to study, teach, and do science. Science is a cooperative enterprise spanning the generations. It's the passing of a torch from teacher to student to teacher, a community of minds reaching back to antiquity and forward to the stars. And so Carl Sagan ascended into the stars, and we looked inside us was an angel, and he said, uh, go and, and do likewise, just as Carl Sagan had left, so will he come back to the earth. And uh, you better not be found sitting here doing nothing. You better preach his gospel before uh, he comes back and judges the world or something like that. Uh, did anybody else get that sort of hint? I'm sorry for the sarcasm there, but really? I mean, I'm sure Carl Sagan was a great guy. Uh, but wow, I mean, that's a lot of reverence towards somebody who's a mere human. Uh, I mean, is this supposed to be some sort of new religion or something? Uh, sorry, it just kind of bothers me. and That's kind of out of character for me. I don't mean to... 
uh, to sound like a jerk here, um, but I, I like I said, highly suspect an agenda, and I think that that small sound bite right there uh, really uh, exposes the agenda that um, hey, uh, we don't who needs religion anymore? We got science. Uh, and uh, through science, maybe we can even invent our own religion uh, that's uh, that's better than all those old religions that date back to uh, the beginning of time, basically. So uh, that's all I got for right now. Uh, feel free to post underneath this. I would love to see what people think uh, for all the criticism I'm about to receive. But uh, God bless you all anyway, and I look forward to reading what you have to say.